Welcome to another video explaining the universe using the particle model. Well, besides a new stinger this time, I also have a short video about the logo of our new book. The title of our book is Principia Mathematica 2. And as you can see, we have an apple, a smaller apple inside the larger apple. Well, today's video is about the inductor and uh, the RL circuit, that is the resistor inductor circuit. Oh, I've stated this any number of times, but uh, I think it's always worth st stating again. This is about how a magnetic field is generated. G1 particles that pass through a copper wire are guided by the internal G2 gravity forces, causing them to move in a spiral path. Yes, that's a corkscrew. But the copper wire is well ordered, is uh, when we make it uh, as a uh, uh, conductor for conducting G1s, it doesn't go through straight, it flies through like an asteroid flies through our galaxy, except our galaxy would have to have well ordered objects in it. But as a result of it going through in a spiral, the G1s escaped and are trapped by the same G2 gravity that surrounds the wire. And so a mag the magnetic field is made of G1s flowing in a spiral around the wire. A little added diagram here shows red G1s flowing uh, over the top and back behind the wire and then down and forward and then up and around and back again. Yes, they're flowing at speed C to the right, and yes, uh, it's a spiral. They don't stay there in circles. They move in a spiral motion. One of the reasons that I came up with the idea that the electron or the G1 had to be the source of a magnetic field is when you do this kind of thing, all you have is a battery and a copper wire. So where would you think there'd be any particle, any object at all that would come out of the wire and or, or be around the wire and form a magnetic field? Only thing available is from the battery that's generating electrons, or in our case, generating G1 particles. What else is really available? Maybe something out of the atmosphere? No, more likely, right out of the wire. So that's the magnetic field, and an inductor, of course, has a magnetic field. You take that same wire, and you can coil it around a, around a cylinder, the magnetic field G runs around each loop of the wire. Each one has, each point in here has a, a, move, a loop that's uh, moving around and around. And it combines to make a magnetic field that flows around and through the coil. So if you apply the left-hand rule, which I confirm is, uh, is valid for a particle analysis of a magnetic field, you have the G1 particle coming in, going back, and if you put your hand up there, your, your left hand, gonna get in the right place, and you curl it around and, and see which way your fingers are going on the inside of the coil, your hand is in the back, thumb is pointing up, magnetic field 
is going as we see it there. So that's, it starts with the, just the uh, uh, magnetic field around the wire. By the way, it starts back here. This is a copper wire, and there is a magnetic field going around in a spiral motion before it even gets to the coil or the inductor. Well, we're going to analyze today really the uh, resistor inductor circuit. Simple example. 9 volt battery emitting G1s, a 1 millihenry coil or inductor, a 1 kilo ohm resistor, and a switch. These are some of the constants I used uh, in previous examples. Uh, volts per G1. Each G1 I've assigned 0 0.1. That's arbitrary number. Nothing necessarily real about it, just a number to talk about. So if you have that value of VG1 is 0.1, then a 9-volt battery is going to give you 90 G1s coming out, and they're going to flow around the circuit. Uh, for the resistor, I've used this value in previous examples. It is arbitrary, 5 times 10 to the minus 6 for the interaction factor, which ultimately, when you analyze this, and I'll show that in a while, it shows that when this circuit is stable and running, yes, there are 18,000 G1s generally flowing around the circuit. Okay, this is the uh, waveform. This is the current waveform for that circuit. And this is the voltage across the inductor. It starts out at a maximum value. Doesn't show show it there. It's in the equation. It, it starts out with a maximum value of V, which is the battery voltage, 9 volts. Starts out at 9 volts and decays exponentially down to 0. Uh, now, the <coughs> this circuit has a 1 millihenry inductor and a 1 kilo ohm resistor and a uh, 1 go into it in detail, but the time constant for this circuit is the inductor inductance value over the resistance, which is one microsecond. And as you can see here, tau, the, uh, which is the uh, uh, time constant, uh, it takes five time constants or five microseconds to get to a steady state condition. So this is what we're looking for. You're going to Throw the switch, turn it on, and see what what happens in in that circuit. But let's start at the end, like I, I just said, in five time constants. Uh, in the end, the, where you have the switch closed, uh, the value of B is equal to 18,000 uh, Gs, G1s. They're flowing in this direction. That's a lot of G1s. That sets up a very strong gravitational field all around the circuit. I just emphasize this part to show that when the, the uh, G1s flow this way, they escape the wire and eventually generate a field that's going this way because that's the direction of the G1s. That's going to be the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, initially, uh, no loss to the inductor, so that uh, no loss of G1s to the inductor. That's a little bit contradictory, but uh, I'll back up. I'm sorry, I'm at the end, not at the beginning. If the magnetic field is full and complete, there's no way for these to escape anymore for two reasons. The magnetic field is full, and the G2 force, which is labeled net force, which is labeled F2, is very strong, keeping the G1s in. And so therefore, C is also is equal to 18K. The G1s in that case, when you're at the end, steady state, they flow straight through. And so you have 18,000 coming into the resistor, and you have a loss to the resistor, which is equal to the number in times the interaction factor times 1K, which is 90. And so D ends up being 17,910. 
that's a D, which is a D is A is equal to D uh, for the next cycle, and then uh, B add, uh, is adds 90 to get back to the 18K. Stable circuit, no G1s are lost in the inductor. There is no voltage drop across that because when the value here equals the value here, there is no loss of G1s, there is no voltage drop. There is loss of G1s here with ATK and there is a voltage drop. So that's the end. Now we're going to see how we get there. So the initial state is with the switch open. There is no magnetic field and there's uh, point A has zero G1s. With this open, whatever happened before doesn't matter because there's nothing, uh, even if there's something coming here, it can't get across the switch. A is zero, B is 90, and now you have a very small amount of G1s flowing through. There's no magnetic field. So most of them, unfortunately not all of them, not 90, are, are lost in the inductor. I say lost in the sense they can be stored in the magnetic field or not. But they're lost so that there is a loss across here but in a way still many of them still pass through so you have a, a, a loss here as well but you're starting out with only 90 G1s so you're not much here, not much there and in and, and the particle model, most seem to go through with the switch uh, uh, open. You don't add anything. You still have the same condition. Battery emitting 90 G ones every interval, some interval of time. Don't know what the time is. Some interval of time. And if it sits that way, well, it, uh, it's going to eventually wear out, but it takes a long time, which really indicates how many G1s are really possible in that uh, uh, battery, coming from that battery. Okay, so here's the hard part, and I apologize for all of these words. It's uh, unavoidable I guess uh, or could have tried to spread it out over some screens but now you when you're going to build it you close the switch the 90 G ones go through and they start building a little bit of a magnetic field you get some G ones coming through you get a little bit of loss here but now it's, instead of zero arriving you have some number arriving and to that number you add uh, the uh, 90 and so this G1 increases right here this G1 increases which means you get more trapped in the magnetic field more going through you have more loss but you still have more going through so even though you, lo you only lose a percentage this increases now you have 90 plus even a larger number and the number keeps increasing and increasing and the magnetic field builds up. Uh, initially, this chart says it must lose 90. You should be losing 90 at the beginning. Uh, my model, my calculations show that didn't happen. Doesn't mean I got the right model and the right uh, answer there, but uh, it, it, to me that's not uh, unexpected. Uh, so uh, once the uh, the ones lost cause a voltage drop, you, you know, cause a voltage drop inductor, and that should be 90 right at the start, and and it gets less and less as time goes on because the magnetic field uh, increases, the uh, leaving less room for them to be uh, part of the magnetic field. And as you get more and more G1s, you have a stronger and stronger field. Uh, at the very beginning, almost none are lost in the resistor, but as G1s increase, this builds up. Uh, you get a, a bigger and bigger loss through here, which 
means the uh, current uh, through that resistor is going to get bigger and bigger because the current is directly related to how many B1, G1s are entering the resistor. And whatever's left entered the batter, you add 90 and it keeps increasing and increasing. So the current keeps increasing and you have the uh, most loss at the beginning and then it dies until it's full when the battery is, when the magnetic field is full. Uh, all of the G1s pass through because there's no room and the force is very strong. Well, the interesting, one of the interesting things about it is, is when is collapsing the magnetic field and that happens when you have this fully charged and you open the switch. And what happened, the first thing that happens when you open the switch is like the, at the beginning. There's virtually none coming this way. All the ones, you've got 18,000 flowing through here. You, you don't lose any here. You lose 90 here. You got 17,910 and they got nowhere to go. They disappear in the space. There's zero coming in here. You're back down to 90. All of a sudden, this flow drops a huge amount. Well, the F2 field doesn't change that. Nothing changes instantly. So the F2 force field, the net force of the G2 gravity is there, will actually push these G1s towards the coil and this force will push towards the coil and they will couple in, but they are going down this way, you push them in and you push these in, it's going to cause a huge current or flow of G1s this way backwards through the battery to this point. A large number here. Well, when this went to, so, you know, these are the battery still doing this 90, this and 90 again and 90 again. So there's there's some coming here, but there's obviously very little, and there's a huge amount going that way. So we've got G1s going both ways. Got a large value here, small value here, which gives the possibility of a spark. This is almost like an, a charge that's developed. The instant this opens up, boom, within the, within, because they're moving at speed C up to here. And that, if the gap is small and the difference is large, you can get a spark across that. And, and, and this is uh, actually becomes negative. Uh, this voltage point here was 9 volts. Now uh, it's becomes negative as and, and that's where this huge spike comes from. All these 18,000 G1s going here, a big spike. Now, if you put your fingers close to the switch, or if you can, right there inside it, be in that gap, you may actually have G1s flow through your finger. <laughs> I, I could, you, you know, anyone who's experienced a, a shock off a doorknob uh, from a Van de Graaff generator is even more, that can hurt. G1s of a high volume can actually hurt. Of course, the spark is no different than a lightning. And when those uh, high volume of G1s do move across because the F2 force is going to push them across, they will interact with the atmosphere, uh, scatter off of the particles in the atmosphere and give you a, uh, a, a visual, the, a, a, the light that happens because the G1s hit and they heat up the air and the, you, you get this white or yellow type of light. Yeah, the, that hurts. But there's one last thing that's happening here. There's oscillations here. Let's go back. We just lost, we just opened the switch. 
these the, the magnetic field was pushed down, and instead of current flowing this way, or instead of G1s flowing this way, we got G1s flowing that way. Well, even though this F2 force is collapsing from the first part of the field that was generating during building it, now you uh, now the G2 force is going to uh, in, uh, increase again because you've got the G1s flowing down down this way, and now the magnetic field, the flow of uh, the particle is going to generate a magnetic field going the opposite direction because the G1s are going in the opposite direction. It's going to go around this way. And it, it, it's going to build up to a certain point. And, and what, what that build up is is a reflection of this mo motion going back up. And, uh, it, it, and, and you, you get this oscillation. So what happens is you actually you have a very strong magnetic field, it's, and then when the switch opens, it collapses a little, and then it rebuilds, and then it collapses again, and it rebuilds, and it, you know, until it, it's gone. And it's the it's the changing of this flow back and forth, caused by the first one is is, is from this direction. The negative spike is from that direction. The positive spike is returned because it, it it reverses again and goes that direction. You've got G1s going back and forth, F2 force field building up, uh, building up, collapsing, building up, collapsing, until there's no <coughs> no field. Okay. This was a hard part. I, I want to do calculations using a spreadsheet. And I tried in any number of equations specifically for this equation down here, and, and I wasn't having any look. I, uh, to be honest, I worked about four days trying to get something that was reasonable. But I, I need to tell you about the assumptions. The loss across the inductor the G1s lost is proportional to the number of G1s that go into the inductor. That, that's the number B, B. G1s lost is proportional to the inductance. This is a, a simple understanding. The larger the coil, uh, the more it can store. So the, the loss, the G1s lost is proportional to the inductance. The interaction factor for the inductor is different than for the resistor. You've got something more going on here. It's just not a G1's hitting objects and scattering off and going away. It's now being uh, spiraling through the wire in such a way that it, it gets lost into a magnetic field. And then there's the dynamics of the magnetic field going on. So I'm expecting the internet interaction factor for the inductor to be different. I'm assuming, big assumption, that a fully charged magnetic field is 18,000 G1s. It's not arbitrary. Yeah, that's the base number I talked about. You got 18,000 in. Uh, the base number, when it's fully charged, has to have 18,000 flowing around. And I'm assuming with 18,000 in the magnetic field, it should generate something like a negative 9 volt spike when the circuit is open. So it's not totally, totally arbitrary, but I really don't have any basis for that. And the, I, the G1s are added to the magnetic field equals whatever is lost. That's not, that's not really true at all. I, I, I had to make that a simple assumption. Uh, you can have the G1s lost out of the wire due to the copper wire itself. Uh, it may get lost, and it's a spiral, but it doesn't quite match the field, and it's lost into space. So uh, it may not get added to the magnetic field, but I made this assumption to keep the spreadsheet analysis simple. But here's the one uh, final one I had to add, that the number lost is proportional to 1 minus the percent full. Percent full, once you know how many are stored, 
You can calculate the percent by taking the number stored, divided by 18,000, you get percent full. And all this term is doing, one minus the percent full, is showing you that at the beginning, when it's not full at all, they're all stored. And at the end, when they're, they're, it's full, percent full is one, there's none stored. So there's logic to this. And, and, and so you get the percent full is the number stored divided by 18,000. And so G1's lost is proportional to the number into the, which is B, is proportional to the inductions, inductance, which is L, and is proportional to one minus the percent loss. That's the formula. The interaction factor for the inductor is different than the resistor. I labeled it different. Interaction factor for the inductor this was my equation in the spreadsheet for determining how many are lost and hence what the voltage drop across the resist the inductor would be. And these are the TPM equations. Uh, battery adds 90, uh, and this is I just showed you how I developed that. The loss through the through the resistor is the C. Input C times the inductance factor. I should have put a little R there. This is the inductance factor for the resistor times the value of the resistance. And uh, so these are the, the equations I use as you go across the spreadsheet. And this is the results. I can tell you I had any number of different shapes because one thing I had to do was, and I admit it, I played with the values. Uh, I played with the voltage value. I played with the uh, the interaction factor. I, I le for the inductor, I left the resistor alone. I played with the base value. Was it really eighteen thousand, or should it be, would it be something else? And and so I I played with that. Well, but I didn't get what the, you're supposed to get exactly. But it wasn't bad either. Uh, this uh, this is 10 G1s, 20, 30. This is the loss across the inductor. It only got to 43. That, that's that's all it would get to. It didn't get to 90. Did not get there. But once it got there, it did decay. It, it did come down as a, apparently like an exponential. Uh, secondly, this should have gone up like like a nice smooth curve, and it's got this dip in here, which is happening somewhere around here. Uh, that's not right. Uh, this is the loss of voltage across the resistor. It also represents the current, and uh, it's not right. I admit it, and I did a lot of tweaking, but the the important point is. I used the ideas of the particle model to develop the equations, put it in a spreadsheet. Yes, I had to tweak it to get there. There's a lot more work to do. Four days is not long enough to get an answer, a good answer for this circuit. Maybe a year working on, 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 on whatever ideas that are missing here or that, 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 so that need to be added. Well, uh, these these were the equations. Uh, these are the values I used. Uh, uh, the, I, I even adjusted this. I adjusted this. Look at that number. That The curve I just showed you said the interaction factor is 10. It's a multiplier, not a, a fractional thing. Normally, when you think of G1's going through a circuit, only a few of them. This, this is... A, unusual to say the least that the uh, IFL was 10. I, I went up and down all over the place. I had negative numbers. Uh, then I went to positive numbers and a lot different ones. And then along with all these these values I tweaked. I didn't tweak this though. That stayed the same. So I'm guessing at the ones that there, and, and I guessed it, and it's kind of interesting because once you have the spreadsheet in place, you can change these numbers 
and immediately you got a new curve. It's, it, it, it really is uh, remarkable to see uh, that kind of analysis going on with a spreadsheet. No fancy mathematics. This is all algebra. It's all algebra, nothing fancy. My name is Bob D. Hilster, and I am your Particle Model Guru. Tune in next time when I'll explain more of the universe using the Particle Model. Thank you for your attention.